something I've never done before. I'm going to share my testimony a little bit about that. But today's message, if you're taking notes, is called The Narrow Road. And the reason that it's called that is because I found in my walk with Jesus, you know, sometimes it can get lonely. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today because that's something that I really kind of walked through. And now I just wanted, I felt like God wanted me to share this message because some of you might be walking through that too. So I just wanted to share my experience and kind of like what strengthened me through that. So with that being said, we're going to just get started. Um, so I've always been a Christian, if you guys know me. Like, my parents are pastors. I've been underneath my dad, like, my whole life, you know. Me and my sister both have always been in church and things like that. I've always loved Jesus. But I almost got to a point in my life where I was just kind of, like, becoming a normal teenager. Like, I was just going along with what everyone else was doing. I really, I'm a words of affirmation girl. So I was just kind of, like, I was based off of what other people said to me. Like, I, words of validation were a thing for me. Like, I had to have that. So I did a lot of things so that people would accept me and things like that. And that's kind of like one of my main struggles was. But this summer, I went to an internship at a college that I'm going to go to, and it's in Hamilton, Alabama. And um, there I was at this internship, and all week I had just, like, learned about all these things from Jesus, and they were just so awesome. But at the end of the week, there was a conference, and I went to, like, every single night, and it was so awesome. But on the very last night, I had an encounter with God like I had never had one before. Like, we were just in the middle of worship, and all of a sudden, I just fell out on the floor, and apparently I was out for, like, two hours. And I honestly, that through that entire time, all I did was just cry and just talk to God. It was almost like... Like I like was taken from my body and like just sat down and talked to God for two hours. And it was the most life-changing experience of my life. But during that time, I just felt God tell me that I was marked and that I was about to go into a stage of life that was going to be like never before. That I was, I was set on fire for God that I um, didn't even want to go back to um, for my senior year of col- high school before I went to college. I was like, I don't want anything to tamper with what God had given me. And that was kind of like the place I was in. So during that time um, that I was had my encounter with God. He gave me like this vision to have the move. That's kind of where I am right now. But the part of my testimony I really kind of want to talk about is that I didn't want to go back to high school for my senior year. I don't know if y'all have ever dealt with that, but I didn't want to go back like I wanted. I asked the admissions guy there. I was like, is it possible for me to get my GED and just move here? Like I did not want anything to come between me and this fire I had for God. Like I didn't want anything to tamper with it. So, um, I decided just to go back to my senior year of high school. I was just going to go through and do it because I felt God tell me these words. He said, Malachi, if you go to a place that's already lit up, that's already brought for me, to all this place where everyone else is already running after God, if you go there, you're going to do great. But what about the people that are still in the darkness? What about the people in Texarkana that don't know about God? And I was like, God, well, whenever I go to Texarkana, I feel like I'm just constantly in darkness. I feel like I go to my high school and there's no one there that is serving God. I feel like I walk around and like everywhere is just dark and I just can't feel your presence very well there and he said well if you don't if you don't go back to the dark it's going to stay dark you're a lot and you have to go back there so um, what I had to do is say no to my flesh over and over and over again and yes to what God was telling me to do and that's kind of like where how I got where I am today because I think about where I was like a couple of months ago and I think about the three closest people in the world to me every single one of those people aren't even in my life anymore so I think about where I'm at now and I have the best friends in my entire life right now And I think about where I used to be and where I'm at now. And I'm so thankful for that journey. But during that journey, I had a lot of time of aloneness. I remember that I was walking through high school and I felt like a complete stranger. I don't know if any of y'all have ever dealt with that. But I felt like I didn't have any friends. No one understood God like I did. Like everyone said they were Christian, but really their actions weren't proving it. And I was like, God, like I'm so on fire for you. Why does no one else feel the same way? And so it was just because the people I was around. So you know what I did? I started doing everything God told me to do. And anytime he'd tell me to post something, I would post it. Anytime he told me to um, share a prophetic word in church, I would do it. Anytime he told me to go and do this or step out of a conversation or step away from a group of people, I did it. And what I had to do was say yes to God every single time he told me to do something. And that's the reason why I'm at, where I am today. But during that time, like I was telling y'all, I had a season of aloneness. I remember um, whenever I started getting like a change of friends, like the people that I used to be friends with kind of started stepping away from me. I was like, God, I don't understand why you're doing this, but I know it's for a reason. And he began to show me, he said, right now you're on the narrow road. And I was like, God, what do you mean by that? So I don't know if any of y'all are kind of getting what I'm saying, but whenever you are going like on fire for God walking, you're going to be on this thing called the narrow road, which means a lot of people aren't going to walk in that direction. A lot of people aren't going to do that because it's narrow and not many people can fit on there and it's harder to walk on. So I think of like sidewalks, you know, like a narrow one, a lot of people don't walk on, but the one that's broader and has more like wider space, a lot of people walk on because more people can fit there. 
So as I was preparing for this message, I felt God tell me to go to Matthew 7, 13, and I know y'all guys are already flipped there. And so he actually told me this this week, and I was like, okay. So I flipped to Matthew 7, 13, and guess what it's called? It's called the narrow gate. And I was like, that's just how amazing God is. Like, he knew exactly what I was going to preach on, and I really, like, did not look this up. Like, he completely told me to read this verse. So here's what it says. Come to God through the narrow gate, because the wide gate and the broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and the difficult ways lead to eternal life. So few will even ever find it. Okay, so I kind of want to break that down. The first part, I love how it says, when God is saying, come to me through the narrow gate. What that means is it may get lonely. You may feel like you're alone, but this is the way I want you to walk. I don't want you to walk like everyone else. And I think about whenever we're a follower of Christ, that's not living in accordance to the way that this world works. That means we have to be different. That means we have to stand out. And I think about, well, I'll get it all that later. But anyways, that, I love that verse because it says, the wide, and gate, the wide gate and the broad path is the one that everyone else is walking on. So that's not the road you're supposed to go on. He clearly tells us that you're going to walk the opposite direction. One time my dad sent me this video, and it was like all of these sheep walking in a row. And there was a wolf that just ran the opposite direction. And I was kind of like, Dad, what is this? And then I began to kind of realize because there was a person preaching in like the background of the video. And he was saying, you know, if you're going to live, if you're going to be different than everyone else, if you're going to ever do anything of your life, you can't stay in your comfort zone and you're going to have to walk the opposite direction of what everyone else is doing. And so in the season of aloneness, I was kind of like feeling, I was walking through, I was like, God, I literally feel like I have no one besides you and my parents, my family. But other than that, I was like, God, I feel like I don't have a best friend. I feel like I uh, like just kind of like alone right now. And here's exactly what he told me. He said, let me walk with you. So I remember whenever he told me this, I was sitting in my closet like alone, which is where I have like my prayer time. And I was crying and I felt him tell me, let me walk with you. And that has stuck with me for, for forever, like for months. Every time I feel alone, he immediately tells me, let me walk with you. And even sometimes before I preach, if I get a little bit nervous, he tells me, he says, let me walk with you through this whole thing. And so that was so like, amazing to me because God was telling me, even though you're alone, you're not alone because I'm with you. There's a song actually by Rick Payne, and I'm going to play it for you guys later. And it says, it, the lyrics, it says, I know it may get lonely, but I know I'm not alone. So yeah, I may feel lonely sometimes, but you have someone so much greater with you all the time. And I love that verse and how it's saying, whenever you walk the narrow road, I'm, you're walking towards God and he's walking with you. And I love that. So um, I think about if, if we want to live radically for God, we're going to have to walk alone for just a little bit. But what, what I did was during that time, I started stepping out and doing things for him. I looked at who else was running after God, and then they became my best friends because they were walking the same road I was. That's how me and Braylon became friends. I started looking at who was going after God, and she's my cousin too, so I'm kind of given. But um, I started looking at who else was running after God with everything in their heart. And then I started becoming friends with them, and we began to relate. We began to talk about things. And that's how I became such good friends with others, through God. Like, literally, he, what, when God shuts one door in your life, he will open another one. You have to trust that. So um, I have four things, four scriptures that I'm going to go over with you guys. Because during this time in my life, whenever I was feeling a sense of aloneness, and I was like, God, I don't know what your plan is for me right now. And he began to show me these four verses, and they're kind of like what got me through that stage and into where I'm at right now. And I'm going to share it with you guys for anyone that's kind of feeling the same way or feel like they've walked through this before. And the first verse is this, Matthew 20, 16. I'm going to let you guys flip there. Okay, here's what it says. Now you can understand what I meant when I said the first will end up being last and the last will end up being first. Everyone is invited, but few are chosen. Okay, so those are some amazing verses, but I love that because um, there's another verse that's right next to it, and it's in Matthew 2, and it says, it's in Matthew 20, no, Matthew 19, 30, and it says, but many who push themselves to be first will find themselves to be last, and those who are willing to be last will find themselves first, and honestly, that has, like, so much to do with the, like, stage of high school that I've been at now. A lot of people, like, you can just kind of look around your high school, and you can find people that are, like, pick me, I want to be first, you know, they push themselves to be first, they post stuff so people will see them, they like do things in front of everybody so people will see them, they want to be validated by the world. But the Bible says people that are pushing themselves to be first actually find themselves to be last. And I know that I have walked through a couple of seasons of disappointment, like God, why do those people get to be in front of everybody? Why do those people get to do those opportunities when I've been humble this whole time and they've been in everyone's face, you know, things like that. And so God began to like show me these verses. He says, the people that are pushing themselves to be first will actually find themselves to be last. But because you're humble, you'll find yourself to be first. And I love 
the next part of that verse, how it says, everyone is invited, but few are chosen. And it makes me think of the narrow road. You know, everyone is invited to walk that, but only a few people actually will. And so um, the next verse is this. Um, it's Matthew 16, 24, if you guys want to flip there. All these are Matthew because whenever I first got like completely on fire for God, that was the first thing I read, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But here's what it says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely and reject and disown your own life. And if you are willing to share my cross and experience it as your own, you will continually surrender to my ways. For if you choose self-sacrifice and lose your life for my glory, you will continually discover true life. But if you choose to keep your life for yourself, you will forfeit everything that you're trying to keep. Okay, those verses are super, super powerful. And honestly, I've been dwelling on those for the past couple of days. Because they're so powerful, and I love how it says, if you truly want to follow me, and I love how Jesus is saying this to his disciples. One of the reasons that I love Matthew so much is whenever I had this encounter with God, that's the first book of the Bible that I really started to read because I was like, when my prayers was, Jesus, I want to be like a disciple him so much. So I was like, Jesus, I want to be like a disciple. So what I do is in Matthew, he talks to his disciples. He does a lot of teaching with them, and that's why I love Matthew so much. But in this, he's saying this to his disciples. For you to completely follow me, you have to disown your own life. That means to get rid of. And I think a lot of times like our mindset is if I want it, if I desire it, I'm going to get it. And that's why a lot of people like that other verse was saying, push themselves to be first. They want to push what their natural mind wants. But in the reality of what God is saying, he says, you can't feed your natural self and follow me. And a lot of us say, if I, like I was saying, if, you, if I desire, I'm going to get it. But Christ is saying, you can't feed your belly everything it desires and follow me. You have to disown what you want because I, my ways are higher than yours. And I love that because a lot of times we all think we know what we want. We are in control of our life. And I think a lot of Christians even make the mistake of saying, you know, Jesus, I'm going to be a Christian, but I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to be in control of my life. You just, you stay over there, I stay over here. But really Christ is saying, I'm not just some God you put in a box. I consume your life. And I help you make your decisions because my ways are higher than yours. I think about where I was like five months ago and I think of where I'm now. If I would have said yes to my spirit, I would, if I would have said yes to my flesh, I would never be where I'm at today. And, but because I said no to myself and yes to his plan, that's the reason I am where I am today. That's the reason I have these um, certain opportunities that I get to do. And so I just love that verse because it really is just like a thing that you can think of. And so my prayer for myself for a long time was, I said, God, I want to lose myself completely so I find myself in you. And that sounds like really extreme. Like whenever you preach that, you don't get a lot of amens because people are like, what? Like, why are you trying to lose yourself? That's weird. But the thing is, yeah, that's a little bit extreme, but I think in the time that we're in right now, I think it's time for Christians to get a little bit extreme about their God. I mean, people can get up there and say that they can change their identity and do all of this stuff, and there's just so much craziness in the world. So I think it's okay for Christians to get a little bit extreme about what they believe. Don't y'all think? So um, everybody right now wants to post, you know, that they're a Christian, things like that, like I was saying a little bit ago. A lot of people, like, say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. They post all this stuff on their Instagram, but then their actions don't line up. And like I'm saying, everyone wants to be a Christian until Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay, so another verse is Matthew 10. And whenever I first, like, read this verse, I was like, Mom, I'm getting this tattoo to my arm. I love this verse so much. And it's where I'm starting from verse 1. Here's what it says. So Jesus gathered his 12 disciples and imparted to them authority to cast out demons and to heal every sickness and every disease. Okay, the first bit of that is so powerful because the first word imparted means to give uh, knowledge, not just to like just say it to them, but so that they like start to believe it. So that word is already super powerful in that verse. And it says, I'm imparting to you authority. The word authority means that you have a power over something. So Jesus is saying, you have power over any kind of thing that the enemy has over you. So first of all, he is equipping them with purpose. Okay, the next part of the verse I'm going to read to is in verse 6. And it says, Go instead and find the lost sheep among the people of Israel. And as you go preach this message, heaven's kingdom realm is accessible, close enough to touch. And I love that the first part of that verse I was reading in verse 1, it's saying that I'm giving you this authority. And the second part of that verse, it says, I want you to go find the people that are lost and tell them that my kingdom realm is accessible. And I think that's something that a lot of Christians have begun to sleep on. 
And so that's the reason I wanted to get that tattoo to my arm because I think that's so amazing. But Jesus is saying, first of all, go find the lost people and then tell them God's not some God that you put in a box. No, he is someone that wants to have a relationship with you. He desires to have a relationship with you. I live in James 4. I don't remember the exact verse. I think it's James 4, 8. It says that he is a jealous God. That means you can't worship your own idols because he wants to be the only one that you worship. And a lot of people don't like to talk about that. They think it's weird. They think it's awkward. But no, Jesus is, God is a jealous God because because he desired to have a relationship with you. And he even told, that's what I'm saying, how he was saying um, that I have to be the only one in your life. He says, you can't worship something else and me. You can only worship me because, like I said, he's a jealous God. And I love how it's saying heaven's kingdom realm is so close, you can touch it. You can feel it. That His presence is tangible whenever it falls over you. And so, like I was talking about the narrow road, sometimes people think it's weird. You know, you're the weird Christian girl, started a Bible club. That's what people tell me at school. And, um, but the thing is, I'm proud of that at this point because the narrow road is so powerful because I felt what God's presence feels like. I know what God's face looks like. I've experienced him personally, and now I want nothing more in the world than to see other people experience that too. So once you get one glimpse of what Jesus looks like, you'll never want to go back to that. Okay, the fourth verse is John 12, 23. If you've been coming to the move, you've heard me preach this a thousand times because this is one of my favorite verses ever. It ends up being a true seeker of God. And I think this is something that I really has like, this is one of the verses that has like absolutely changed my life. And I'm going to read it to you guys. It says, we're going to start off in verse 23. It says, he replied to them, now is the time for the son of man to be glorified. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops to the ground and dies because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat all because one grain died. The person who loves his life and pampers himself misses the true meaning of life. But the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find the meaning of true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciple, follow me and you will know where I'm going. And if you truly follow me as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon you. Okay, so that right there, it has so much you can preach on. But one of the parts I really want to talk about is it's saying, if you love your life and pamper yourself your entire life, means like, if that's what I'm saying, like, if I desire something, I'm going to go get it. Because I love my life and I pamper myself because I think I deserve it. But the thing is, God says, if you do that for your whole life, you're missing the true meaning of what this life is for. But if you follow me, you go where I'm going. And during this time, whenever Jesus was talking about this, it was it, it meant like literally, like whenever I think of Matthew, whenever Jesus Jesus called him to be his disciple. He said, drop what you're doing at your job and come follow me. So Matthew stopped being a tax collector to quite literally like walk after Jesus. Like he literally began to live with Jesus and travel with him. But Jesus is saying now in that same way, if I tell you to go, you go. If I tell you to stop, you stop. You are following me with your heart. You're following me with your soul. That doesn't mean just going to church on Sunday. That's not something you just check off a box. Going, I think a lot of people even just go to church just to say they go, just to be a Christian. But going to church means I'm going with a group of people to be, to come to God before him together. But that church is, your Christianity does not stop after Sunday. You don't just flip a switch and change once you go back to your normal day of the week. No, you spend every single day with him. In the narrow road, that's, that's basically what it is, is spending every single moment with God. Whatever God told me, let me walk with you. He wasn't just saying, let's just walk around meaninglessly. He said, no, let's walk the narrow road together. It's going to get hard. It may get lonely, but that's what I'm calling you to do. I'm not calling you to live like the rest of the world is. We already have too much of that. I'm calling you to step into what I've called you to do. I think of, this is completely off of what I'm talking about, but I think of um, whenever the Israelites got set free from the Egyptians, I'm sure most people know the story, but the Israelites, whenever they got out of Egypt and God was saying, okay, now that I've delivered you from something that was oppressing you, now I want you to step into the promised land. But to get to the promised land, they had to go through some things. They had to fight some giants. And a lot of people were too scared of the giants that they wouldn't go into the promised land. So they walked around the forest for 40 years before they ever stepped into the promised land. Why did they do that? They did that because their natural minds could not get over the fact that they had to fight a giant. But whenever God's on your side, you can fight any giant. So if you stay in that middle ground, delivered from something, but not stepping into what God's calling you to do, I think that's what a lot of people live in, then your life will be absolutely miserable because that's what, that's what it was misery for them. They even said, I wish I could go back to Egypt. I wish I could go back to the sin I used to be in, the strongholds I used to be in, because they were in that middle ground. But the thing is, 
Walking the narrow road is not staying in the middle ground. That's saying, God, I'll overcome any giant. I'm okay with being alone because I just want you. I just want what you have for my life. And so, yeah, you may have to overcome some giants, but when God's on your side, you already know the battle is going to be in your favor. God doesn't lose a battle. He's not about to lose one now, especially with your life. He's saying, if you if you lean on me in every decision of your life, we may, we're may we going to walk a narrow road, but you know what? You're not going to be alone. I'm with you. And then I'm going to bring other people on your road with you. Okay, so that's my message. Um, I hope this really encouraged you guys. If you want to talk about it later, we're going to go eat after, and you, you can, of course, come and talk to me. But now I just kind of want to go into a time of prayer. And what we do is we just kind of.